We'll, we'll now begin a five-minute round of questions. We'll try to keep the back and forth to about, about five minutes. We'll begin with Senator Young. Well, I thank the chairman and ranking member for holding this hearing to discuss accountability and taxpayer risk in our higher education system. I'll just note uh, uh, as I start here that I, I have a provision in the reauthorization of this Higher Ed Act that uh, will ultimately consider um, related to income share agreements where philanthropic or private capital is used to fund degree programs. And uh, one would think that uh, whoever puts that money forward would, of course, uh, have a great incentive to see that that student completes their course of study. So it's one of many benefits of uh, the income share agreement approach. Um, Dr. Cruz, I understand that the City University of New York is on the forefront of policies focused on helping students complete their education and not just enroll in a program. And I commend uh, the university for that. Uh, it's voluntarily investing in this initiative. And um, uh, we have other schools that are doing it as well. But uh, you're, you're really a standout in this regard. Because of your institution's commitment to retention and completion, graduation rates have significantly improved. Dr. Cruz, could you share with us what best strategies you've learned about to keep students in school and to increase their likelihood of graduating and uh, also discuss um, your assessment of whether these strategies are scalable to other schools. Thank you, Senator Young. Um, the, all of the strategies are predicated on the good use of data, actionable data that identifies which students need which supports at what time during their trajectory. Um, so, for example, um, understanding that low-income students uh, at community colleges may not only need additional financial supports beyond um, federal Pell Grants, but also for Metro cards and to be able to purchase their books. Understanding that they may need some more structure in, in their, as they pr proceed through their educational journey um, and providing them cohort-based models where they have blocks of time where they take their classes, all of their classes in the morning, afternoon, at night. And also uh, understanding that uh, these students need intrusive advising and the tools in order to be able to progress through their studies in a timely fashion. Those are some of the strategies. More generally, um, we see that um, we also need to take care of other aspects of the students' lives, um, counseling services, health care, child care. Um, we also need to make sure that these students have access to what we call high-impact practices, which are practices that have been shown to disproportionately benefit underserved students, peer mentoring, supplemental instruction, undergraduate research. So it sounds like you're talking about uh, personalized services. You really need to uh, get to know the circumstances, the challenges, uh, the talents, uh, and so forth of the individual students so that you can craft uh, a, a individualized, a personalized approach to dealing with that student's uh, challenges. It's kind of back to the basics, right? That's right. And you have to structure all of your organizational uh, resources towards that end. Okay, it takes leadership from the top, so I commend you uh, for that. Are there uh, particular tools that you think institutions need uh, or encouragement that they should receive, perhaps from government, to ensure that they adopt evidence-based policies and, and we increase graduation results on the back end of uh, such adoption? Sure. I think that we need some uh, minimum standards on what is expected uh, for, for access, for completion, for time to degree, for loan outcomes. Uh, we need uh, some incentive structures that will provide those that are willing and able to uh, pursue improvement uh, to do so. And then, of course, we need uh, some strategies to be able to make sure that those that are not doing their part um, do not get access to the same resources that others do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Delisle, thank you for being here, sir. Um, I am aware of proposals of risk uh, sharing, so-called skin-in-the-game proposals. Uh, and uh, some of my colleagues have, have put forward different proposals. But it's not easy to construct a policy proposal to deal with making sure institutions of, of higher education have skin in the game for their students' successful outcomes. Um, Questions remain regarding nuances and loopholes that could, could create perverse incentives or potentially punish certain institutions for outcomes that are way outside of their control. When examining policies or structures of a risk-sharing model, requiring colleges to pay back a statutory percentage of unpaid student loans sounds, at least, like a good idea in theory, but there could be a variety of complicating factors. 
how can we create risk sharing models that are fair for all participants? Well, I, I think uh, one important thing in, in thinking about a risk sharing model is I think you'd want to pursue this policy as a replacement um, for existing accountability policies and not in addition to. Um, and so in terms of fairness, I think one thing that is fair to institutions is, you know, as, as, as Ben Miller mentioned earlier, that, you know, um, we have many of them because some of them fail in some circumstances. And the approach has been to sort of layer them on because one is failing. And I think that, I, I think you're right, a risk sharing approach is, is a better way to go. Um, it's not gonna be perfect, but I think it should be pursued as a replacement to rather than an, an, an additional accountability measure. Okay, I'll, I'll follow up with you perhaps on, on some more specifics. My, my time is out. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Senator Young. Uh, Senator Murray has deferred to Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you to the ranking member as well. <clears throat> I want to thank her for letting me jump the line. I want to thank our witnesses today. A lot of critically important issues here to, to cover. I'll try to cover uh, maybe two. The, the first thing I wanted to focus on, and I'll, I'll start with uh, Ms. Voigt, uh, is a question of um, tracking outcomes. Uh, we can compare what happens at the elementary and secondary education level as opposed to the higher education. We know that, for example, uh, tracking outcomes for individual groups of students, so-called subgroups, uh, to ensure that schools are responsible for every child, uh, regardless of race or language, proficiency or disability or income. So we've made some progress in that, in that context at that, at that level, elementary and secondary, but uh, in progress, I mean helping to close the achievement gap. But in higher education, data on graduation rates by subgroups is uh, scarce, and that might be an understatement, particularly data with regard to students with disabilities. I've introduced legislation called the RISE Act, which is also sponsored by Senator Cassidy, Senator Hassan, uh, and Senator Hatch, which would help address the issue by requiring institutions of higher education to both uh, both collect and report uh, this data to the extent that would uh, n not reveal personally uh, identifiable information. The collection would include data on uh, graduation rates for students with disabilities, as well as the number and percentage of students with disabilities accessing or receiving uh, accommodation. So here's the question. Is having this type of data important to closing the achievement gap for students in higher education? Thank you for that question and for that focus on uh, the most vulnerable students uh, who are attending higher education. Disaggregated data is absolutely essential to closing, uh, to closing gaps and to ensuring that all students have an equal opportunity to access college and to succeed in college. We've seen that the graduation rate data, it's limited to first time, full time students, but it is disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and gender. And what that's done has uncovered many gaps in completion by race and ethnicity. It's really shown a light on some of these problems. And so it's an example of how better information, especially when disaggregated by key demographic characteristics, uh, like res race, ethnicity, and income status, can, uh, can identify problems within the system and then help us solve those problems through strategies like Jose has identified. Um, so uh, absolutely, we need to, to strive to get better information, more disaggregated information, to answer the very challenges that you raise. We now have better information uh, on completion for part time and transfer students in iPads, which is a great thing. NCS has been able to make those changes. But those part time and transfer rates are not disaggregated by uh, student characteristics like race, ethnicity, um, or disability status, for example. And so there's a great room for improvement to get better information in that way. Thank you for that. And <clears throat> any other um, additional categories that would be important to helping institutions improve these outcomes? Sure. Uh, race, ethnicity is key. 
as is socioeconomic status. Uh, those are the two that are most often um, considered in terms of disaggregating data at the federal level. Um, gender is a key disaggregate that is included. Uh, more and more, we're looking for information on uh, students who are veterans as well and understanding how veterans are faring within our higher education system. And age is an important uh, demographic characteristic as we think about serving today's student who often uh, is not your traditional 18-year-old going right from high school into college. So that's another important characteristic to keep in mind. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm down to a minute. But Dr. Cruz, I'd ask you as well, what are the, the strategies institutions um, can use to support uh, students with disabilities? Institutions need to create the right climate. They need to provide their faculty and their staff the right training to understand that it's beyond accommodations and beyond what the law requires to serve these students well, that it's really about making sure that they have the same types of support to be successful, to uh, complete their degree and get a good paying job or pursue further study. Um, institutions need to staff their uh, disability offices better. Uh, unfortunately, across the country, we have a situation where these offices are um, overworked and rarely get a chance to go beyond uh, the, the scheduling of accommodations and assistive devices. And we also need to invest in uh, innovative uh, programs that will connect um, our students with disabilities to internships and will help them get a leg up as they continue uh, to pursue uh, work later on in life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Casey. Senator Cassidy. Um, Thank you all. Enjoyed your testimony, each of you. And if I had more, I would ask each of you questions. What I will say now will not be to challenge, will not be to kind of disagree as much as to challenge and hopefully advance. Ms. Void, first, thanks for the shout out on the um, uh, College Transparency Act and mentioning we have 130 different folks endorsing it. And it's Cassidy, Hatch, Warren, and White House, and would welcome everybody else. Thank you, and we think it's a good place to start. Going down to student level, everything you just mentioned would be reported. So just to say that. Mr. Carnival, if I have your last name spelled, uh, pronounced correctly, um, uh, a little bit like Carnival, so anyway. Um, That's what it means. Is what it means. Um, the old Pogo line, we've met the enemy and he is us. You're asking for accountability. We are asking for accountability from academia. I have a new Republic article, which I'm sure pained them to write. Rick Perry is right. Uh, but they are saying he was right about his proposed higher ed reforms in Texas. And among, I think, these reforms, and I'm pulling it up, and of course, uh, was asking universities to give prospective unit students choosing colleges more information about class size, graduation rate, and earnings in the job market after graduation. Now, that was one of seven. But the blowback from academia was intense. Uh, they quote there the American Academy of Universities, somehow saying that they were going to punish the universities that complied with this. So now there are other factors, but this is one of them. Are we going to have severe pushback if we do the College Transparency Act that Ms. Voigt spoke of? Uh, because in the, and you're an academician. You're the only academician among them. What, what, what is Georgetown going to say if we have to talk about earnings in the job market after graduation? Well, we've come to a point in the politics of this where the higher ed community has finally accepted the notion that they have to focus on completion. Now, the completion goal is, uh, it is very self-serving. That is, if you say that what we want to do is provide money so people complete college by race, gender, et cetera, uh, what you're saying is if I'm running a pizza stand is uh, I, uh, we want you to sell more uh, full pizzas to people. So what we're saying is we're going to uh, let them, the, the real issue is completion for what? And that's where you get pushback. That is, if you ask higher education to reach beyond its own interests and think about the student's interests after they leave, now to some extent they're right. They don't have as much control over that as, uh, that's a more complicated uh, outcome. But what we have so far uh, is agreement uh, kicking and screaming on the part of higher ed that they're okay with completion because that is a uh, 
reflexive now, now, role. Now, what about earnings after graduation? Because Mr. DeLiesel's De uh, testimony says Harvard dropped a program because they had poor you know, graduate study in art and theater. LSU, King Alexander, the president of LSU, will talk about how the graduation, post-graduation income is pretty good because we put a lot of engineers out there. LSU does. And, and so if it compares favorably. Can the universities, will, will they be kicking and screaming to give that information? Well, there, in a sense, we already have it. That is, the Congress has dropped $780 million on state longitudinal data systems, beginning in the Bush administration, uh, fully funded in the Obama stimulus package. So in any public institution in any state in America, because the states did take the money, um, we now know, because we can hook up wage record data from employers and transcript data from colleges. We know what happens to anybody who takes a program in a public institution, whether they get a job and how much money. But that's not being, but the portion for the the purpose of our bill is that I gather that's not readily available to the, the graduating high school senior who's trying to decide. Is, is that a fair comment? We've built these information systems. They're largely owned by uh, data warlords in different states. Uh, in Virginia, you can find out what you can earn, whether you get a job, no matter what you take, no matter where you go, in a public institution. Uh, but the institutions don't tell you that. I can imagine that would be very scary to privacy advocates. Uh, any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, you know, I, I think when you're, you're reporting statistics, right, about averages, means, percentiles, none of this is actually reporting information about individual students. Um, so, it, I mean, I, I think the privacy concern in, in sort of, and you, there are also protections that you could take. You can, you can suppress uh, any information if the number of students leaving a particular program is small. Right? So if it's fewer than 30, then maybe you wait and, and until you gather more data before you put that out. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of the privacy concerns, again, this isn't, we're not talking about releasing individually identifiable you know, sort of micro data. Everything is sort of rolled up. Okay, well, I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Cassidy. Senator Murray. Thank you. Dr. Cruz, thank you. Thank you to all of you for your testimony. But um, I thank you for emphasizing the need for federal accountability systems to really examine outcomes by students' race and income. Um, despite the implementation issues we've had by the Department of Education, I still believe that maintaining a focus on outcomes for student subgroups was one of the biggest successes of our bipartisan partisan reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And I agree that holding uh, colleges accountable for achievement gaps is necessary and really long overdue in higher education. I wanted to ask you as a college president, can you describe how, if you had them, better accountability systems that put more focus on underrepresented students would help guide your institution's policies and practices to improve student outcomes? Sure. Um, I'm fortunate to be at an institution that takes very seriously its role as an engine of opportunity and is working hard to look at this data as we speak uh, with a goal to double the number of degrees that we produce by the year 2030. Um, but having uh, that be sort of a mandate through um, an accountability system will only strengthen our ability uh, to ensure that we're focusing on the right issues and hopefully that accountability system will come with some incentives that will then allow us, because we are so focused on this issue, uh, to get the resources we need uh, to scale up those things that are really working for our students. And we would, of course, hope that uh, those incentives would also come with uh, protections for the other institutions across the country uh, who may not uh, be uh, doing their part uh, to move uh, in the same direction. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Miller, I, I really appreciate your overview on how to improve our accountability system and your thoughts on the unique risks that are prevalent in the for-profit sector. Can you elaborate for us um, with what some of those risks are and what Congress should be doing to address them? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think it really boils down to the fact that we've seen that the federal financial aid system is constructed so that for-profit colleges can generate large profits and large sums of money and grow without having to show a corresponding level of student outcomes. And what makes that even harder is because the federal taxpayer is the one financing most of the costs of these places, in the wrong hands, the business model becomes all about recruitment, not quality. And so I think what we really need here is sort of a combination of something that deals with the outcome side as well as the business model and finances side. And so I think that means both 
having stronger requirements around loan outcomes and completion, because one of the things we've seen here is that there are some places that have decent outcomes for graduates, but you know, one out of every, only like one out of every five people or so is graduating. And then I think the second thing is we have to acknowledge that we need stronger financial accountability here. You know, we need to make sure that the taxpayer is not the only one paying for these educations. And we also need to make sure that there are stronger checks to say that, you know, you don't grow unless you've got the outcomes to show that you really can sort of sustain the student base you have. So, so how should Congress balance changes that would mitigate those unique risks for the, posed by the for-profits while extending a broader accountability framework for other institutions of higher education? Absolutely. So, you know, I think the first part is we really need to make sure we're tackling the financial incentives at the for-profit colleges. So that to me means a private market test, as well as really thinking about growth strategies and outside ownership. Because I think when you have sort of a disconnect between who's running the school and who owns the school is sometimes where the financial incentives get mixed up. Then I think we should have a conversation about what are the outcomes we want from everybody. And I think there that gets into a measure of something with loan success, a measure around completion, and there has to be a measure around access because we want to make sure that schools are taking in our students who are traditionally underserved and looking at that from an equity standpoint. So we don't want a disincentive for having... Absolutely. You know, I don't think we want to create any incentive that has schools wanting to turn away students of color or low-income students. Low-income, right. Okay. Um, Mr. Jalal, I, I believe that a more robust federal accountability system can help prevent some of the poor student loan repayment outcomes that you talked about. Uh, you re recently wrote in an editorial that a strong incentives-based accountability system is needed to guard against the lowest quality colleges and programs as well as those that are wildly overpriced. What are the three key elements of a strong incentive-based accountability system that would achieve those goals? Well, I, I think one is um, there's a you need to go beyond loans. Um, a, a lot of times this conversation around accountability is kind of stuck around loans. And, and I'm not, and, and I sort of under, I understand how it got there, but what I'm, I'm getting at here is there's a lot of grant aid that goes to these programs and we're measuring outcomes against loans. And so this is a sort of a, a principle I would put out there. I think the reason why in the past policymakers have chosen to measure loans is that they see loans as a proxy for first price, how much did you pay, right? So that's how much you borrowed. And then second is how much are you earning, right? But that's actually translated in the loan context through a payment. So how much did you borrow and how much are you paying down is really supposed to be measuring how much did you pay and how much you're earning. Well, I think that if, if that's what we're after, if that's what Congress is after, they have the means to measure that more precisely than through loans. And then I think that becomes an easy thing to sort of look at at grant aid as well, because there's you know almost $30 billion in grant aid being distributed with none of the accountability measures that apply to loans. Okay, and I'm out of time, but uh, Ms. Sherman, I do have some testimony from Senator Durbin. He asked that we put it in the record, and I was asking him his consent to do that. Thank you, Senator Murray. We'll, we'll do that, but let me pick up on your question, because that's the same question uh, that, that I, I've had. We, we've had a series of hearings. If we want a better accountability, more effective accountability, so that um, colleges have more responsibility for helping to make sure students don't borrow more than they can pay back. What, in addition to the cohort default rate, should we do? That's basically what Senator Murray was asking, I think. And you, you in your testimony, uh, in, in your written testimony, said something about it. She asked you for the three, three most effective things. And is one of them that we would look at the rate of repayment of the loans that the students make? Continue your, yeah. your answer to sure. Senator Murray a little bit. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, yeah, so I think that the loan repayment um, is a more comprehensive and more accurate measure of whether or not students are repaying their loans than default. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, the defaults are costly, they're $4 billion, but income-based repayment, which allows students to pay down their loans very slowly, if their incomes relative to their debt uh, is low enough, um, default rate doesn't capture that. And so you can essentially impose costs on taxpayers by slowly paying down your loan using income-based repayment, but you're not in default. Uh, and so I think a repayment rate, which is which you know has traditionally now uh, be, has come to be defined as, is the student paying down principal you know, by some time frame. Uh, and I think that starts to show you, one, the taxpayer interest in preventing lots of losses under income-based repayment, 
but two, the interest in protecting the consumer, uh, who's also essentially probably borrowed or paid too much relative to what they're actually earning. What about barriers to colleges that exist today? Are, are there federal barriers that keep colleges from advising students how much they should borrow? Anyone have an answer to that? Are there laws, regulations the federal government imposes on campuses? Um, well, I, it's my understanding that they, I, I'm not sure they can actually provide sort of financial advice and counseling, um, but, um, and, and generally what you hear from financial aid offices is they uh, tend to, you know, feel that they have to offer what the federal government says they can offer in terms of loans. I mean, these are entitlements, right? So on the one hand, the school's entitled to the loan as it's specified in federal law if they meet the eligibility criteria. Ms. Voigt, you and Dr. Carnavalli were talking about data. Um, one of the worries I, I used to look at the federal government from the point of view of a governor, and I also saw it when I was education secretary. And basically what I see is a lot of data already, just all over the place. And every time a new set of members of Congress gets elected, they say we need more data. So we just stack it up on top of other data. And Dr. Carnavalli was saying, we're, sounds like we have a lot of good data, but it's, we're keeping it secret from students. So my question is, what would you advise us as we revisit the Higher Education Act? How do we do two things? One is, how do we keep from piling requests for new data on top of data we're collecting which isn't as useful? Uh, num and number two, how do we make sure that whatever we collect that's useful uh, is available to students without micromanaging six or seven thousand campuses? That's a great question. You raise an important point because we really are in a situation where we are data rich but information poor. We have a lot of data, but it's unable to be converted into information to help students make. So, those would you repeal decisions. a lot of laws requiring data, or would you? What would you do about that? So, we need to streamline data reporting What's requirements that? so okay. that the burden on institutions is less. So right now, an institution... Well, who would do that? Uh, well, the College of Transparency would do that. It would streamline reporting for institutions, so the burden would be lower on them. Right now, every institution to complete the IPEDS requirements needs to run code on their campus to calculate those aggregate metrics. They also have to report data, sometimes very similar data, to the Office of Federal Student Aid, as well as yeah. their state data system and their accreditors. Uh, and so the College Transparency Act would allow them to report in a more simple way and make it easier for them to focus on, uh, use their resources. I'm about on out of time. Like Let me ask Dr. Sure. Carnavalli, you, 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 you look at a lot of data. What's your answer to that? Question? Well, I'm one no Johnny on this, so let me warn you. And that is that um, uh, if I'm a college student or the parent of one, I want to know uh, how much it's going to cost. Uh, and when I graduate, um, uh, am I going to get a job and how much am I going to make? Uh, and what kind of career am I looking at? Uh, and then uh, uh, I, either myself or maybe the government can help me or a counselor can figure the cost against the return and I can decide what I want to do. Uh, the rest of it to me uh, is research data. That is, we have plenty of data on um, uh, subgroups and so on in higher education. Uh, I'm, as a political matter, it seems to me it's worth the trade uh, to get rid of a lot of, a lot of the data collection we do now and just have four or five things that we mean. Uh, instead of keeping adding more and more and more uh, data into the equation. And that's a, that's a complicated bargain to put on a piece of paper. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. This has been uh, fascinating and fantastic. I think this is uh, the most important discussion in the context of higher education reauthorization, uh, getting the accountability metrics right, because as has been stated, um, we are wasting billions of dollars. We are wasting billions of dollars on uh, educations that never get completed. We are wasting billions of dollars on schools that aren't delivering uh, outcomes. Uh, and as we've discussed here, there are some pretty simple ways to maybe not get this perfectly right, but get it a lot better than we have today. Um, I, I think the reason why you hear a lot of focus on this question of for-profit colleges is not because we want them to be held to a different accountability system, uh, but because the development of for-profit colleges, which has happened uh, since the past 
passage of the last higher education reauthorization has made accountability more important. When everybody's not for profit, when you are all in the business of delivering an education rather than trying to achieve the highest return for your shareholders, um, accountability isn't as important. It's not that it isn't important, but when you insert into higher education uh, a motivation uh, to deliver return for shareholders, um, then all of a sudden you see the results we have today where 10% of students are going to for-profit schools, but 25% of all federal aid is going to for-profit schools, and 30% of all defaults are happening at for-profit schools. Um, it, it begs us to, to be more concerned about this accountability question. Um, and, and so I have, I have two questions. So Dr. Cruz, I want to ask you um, uh, th this question in the context of your testimony that any federal accountability system has to be tailored to account for differences in institutional missions. Um, and, and that really is the difference between a for-profit and a non-profit. The mission um, is different. And so how do you tailor an accountability system uh, to account for those differences in institutional missions between for-profits and non-for-profits? I think in the in the nonprofits and the publics, we know uh, what that would look like, which is the discussion we're having about integrating equity metrics into into our systems, having better data, and ensuring that the campuses have the right incentives to look at that data and implement the best practices we all know about in order to better serve their students. In the for-profit sector, of course, incentives are different, and the um, accountability structures as well, not just from the federal uh, government's perspective, but also from a state perspective and an accreditation perspective. So I would look at, at the need to uh, better understand what are the incentives and uh, unintended consequences or, or, or perverse incentives for that matter that um, get in the way of for-profit uh, institutions investing more of their uh, earnings towards student success rather than, than profits. And that's uh, where the, the, the lens we should have when we look at accountabilities for them. Mr. Delisle, I wanted to follow up on this fascinating conversation you were having with the chair and ranking member as they were continuing to press you uh, on measurements other than student loan rates that you would recommend go into an accountability system. And, and I'm intrigued by um, that notion, but I don't think you ever got to the set of indicators outside of student loan performance that you would recommend be part of an accountability measurement because you, we sort of shifted from student loan default to student loan repayment, but we're still on student loans. Um, you were suggesting that there's more relevant data that gets more finely to the point of, uh, uh, of, of performance and outcomes than just student loan um, uh, data. So let me just press you once again on that because I think that's a really important conversation. What else would you recommend we look at an accountability system outside of the entire subject of student sure. loans. Well, well, first let me say, uh, picking up on this, this uh, other conversation here, that I, I think that if you have a student-based outcome measure that you're interested in in terms of accountability, you can apply it to different kinds of institutions with different missions because right. you just care about the objective outcome of the student, right? So I, 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 don't, I don't think that's, a, that's preventing you in any way from applying it to different institutions. Um, but in, in terms of uh, other accountability measures, you know, in, in terms of the Pell Grant program, uh, you, could, you could look at um, how much do students earn who, who get the Pell Grant. Right? Even though they don't take out loans, or perhaps the institution doesn't take out loans at all. Um, and here again, you probably want to look at earnings. Are students earning more than a minimum wage uh, on average? Or a certain cut, you know, I think you, we, we can debate the details of where the cut points are. But the Pell Grant program is a big investment. Um, but you also, you know, and some people say, well, we don't need to worry about accountability for students because they don't have to pay that back. But they do get a limited amount of Pell Grants. And so they're using up their limited amount of aid by spending time at a school that may not be paying off. And they're also spending an awful lot of time. And so I think we sort of owe it to them in that regard to attach accountability to grants as well as loans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Murphy. Senator Hassan. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Um, Mr. Miller, I wanted to start with a question for you. The Higher Education Act requires a college to be approved by a combination of oversight bodies, the state, the Department of Education approved accreditation body, and federal government to receive federal financial aid. While this approach creates a system with checks and balances, it can also open the door to parts of the triad not fulfilling their role as intended by the Higher Education Act. 
In your testimony, you say that states, the federal government, and accreditors have played accountability hot potato for too long. You mentioned that this has led to many states and accrediting agencies to not provide enough oversight, which allowed predatory for-profits like Corinthian College and ITT Technical Institute to take advantage of students. So can you explain how, in your research, states and accrediting agencies have struggled to hold colleges accountable? In particular, how do you think states can improve how they work with the federal government and approved accreditors to better examine student outcomes and ongoing guardrails to fulfill their role as a key part of the program integrity triad? Absolutely. So very briefly, just to start with accreditors, one of the things we saw there was that the extent to which they were really considering outcomes uh, was not as strong as it could have been, and that often the orientation was far more toward saying, we'll give you another year to improve, rather than ever saying, you know what, at some point there's enough smoke here, we think there's a fire, and enough is enough. Um, on the state side, I think we have a couple issues. One is the amount of state capacity for oversight of its schools is not particularly high. Right. But I think the thing we could at least start to expect is states being greater overseers of their own money. So for example, in California, the Cal Grant program has its own default rate and graduation rate requirements attached to it. You could see other states start to do that with their financial aid money. And the other part is I think states need to make authorization a more meaningful thing. In some places, it's not much more than a business license and a few hundred dollars. And if that's a path that's going to end ultimately with federal aid money and billions of taxpayer resources, it should be a higher bar than that. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And to Dr. Carnival, uh, there's been a lot of conversation during this reauthorization process about moving from an accountability system focused on institution-level accountability to one focused on program-level accountability. While having access to transparent program level measures is valuable, especially for prospective students, we've seen time and again what happens to student outcomes when institutions are not held to a high standard. I have concerns that if we narrow our accountability metrics to only look at program level outcomes, we'll let institutions off the hook. It's the institution's leadership, the president, senior administrators, and governing board that determine what programs are offered and how the college manages the marketing and recruitment of its students. What do you think we would lose if we switch from institution-level accountability to program-level accountability? Do you think there's a way to use both approaches to best serve students? Uh, I think in many cases you want to do both. You want to do suspenders and a belt in many cases. Uh, institution and program, but if we're ever going to crack the black box of higher education financing mm -hmm. and cost, which yeah. is the primary public issue, yeah. uh, I think we're going to have to change the terms of competition. If we change the terms of competition to the program level, we'll draw in more providers. We're neutral, should be neutral with respect to providers, for profit or not. Uh, we'll then at the same time set up a situation where every college doesn't have to have every program, mm -hmm. sort of cafeteria style. You can have a college that has one. Uh, you set up a whole new competitive environment when you go to the program level and you can then track that. Incidentally, once you get to the program, you can track it to occupations. Yeah. That is, so the institution I think is really an artifact of our history. Uh, I think in many respects it's passe. We're now in a, an era in learning uh, where the microeconomics of learning are really what matter, not the inst and we'll never crack the code uh, in financing in higher ed unless we get below the institutional level. I do understand that. I think the concern is, though, that it is still uh, within institutions. It is the institutional leadership that make decisions based on what's happening with the program. And I think there is some concern that if you insulate the programs too much in terms of accountability or perhaps, uh, you know, the way lawyers think about it, liability, uh, you don't have the institutional leadership really looking at that level of um, service and results that we want from all of our programs. Is that a concern? Uh, frankly, I don't think so. I think institutional leaders, uh, higher education is a business. Um, it has a business model. Uh, and the business model we're running now at the institutional level is incredibly inefficient in large part because it doesn't operate at the program level. It's a package of goods, some consumed, some of investment value. Uh, incidentally, Georgetown won't go away. Uh, 
that is where I am. Uh, yeah. In the end, if you get a bachelor's degree with 40% in a field of study and 60% in general education, we know over the longer term that has more economic value. So when you, looked at the pro when you look at the program data, that will show up. So I think institutional leaders are, uh, they have budgets and boards, uh, and in the end we should drive higher education through those mechanisms. Thank you very much, and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Uh, Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member, and to our um, testifiers today. It was very interesting. And I, I'd like to go to um, something that you said, Mr. Miller. You said how student aid is a deal between students and taxpayers and institutions. And that really makes a lot of sense to me. I think about this in terms of um, a situation we had in Minnesota in uh, uh, September of 2016. Uh, Hennepin County District Court ruled that uh, two for-profit institutions, Globe University and Minnesota School of Business, violated laws um, around consumer fraud and deceptive trade practices. And so then, of course, their um, licenses were revoked, and months after that, they lost their accreditation. And could no longer receive financial aid dollars. So here's clearly a situation where the deal didn't work for um, students and taxpayers. And of course, these students lost not only their you know, money, but so much of it is their time. So as we are working to rewrite the Higher Education Act here, um, I, I also understand that the Department of Education is going through a rulemaking process around um, this issue of gainful employment. Um, could you just talk a little bit about that, how you see that, and what legislative changes you think we ought to be making um, as, we, um, as we look at this whole issue? Absolutely, Senator. And one thing I would just note very briefly is part of what happened with those two schools you mentioned was a failure of their accreditation agency to oversee what was happening there properly. The Department of Education in 2016 rightfully removed that accreditor's ability to access federal financial aid. Now this Department of Education is trying to let them back in later this year, which I think is concerning. But mm -hmm. so I think part of it again gets back to this issue around the business model and the recruitment strategies. And that's where we really see a lot of the problems arise. And that's where part of it is I think the Department of Education, as well as states and accreditors, need to be doing a better job looking at what the marketing materials actually say. What are the promises made to students and how are those things conveyed? We talk a lot about sort of secret shopping on the servicing side of loans. We don't really talk about it at all on the, st on the actual education side of things. I also think we probably need to do a better job getting money before things go out of business. Because what we've seen is that the instant the Department of Education levies a massive fine, the school will immediately close up shop, leaving students and taxpayers holding the bag. We should be much more aggressive in demanding letters of credit from students, I'm sorry, letters of credit from schools up front. And we should also probably consider whether it's worth having a federal tuition recovery fund. So many states have this in place where basically you can at least get your money back, but we don't have one at the federal level, and so it becomes basically who's going to take the loss, the student who's paid or the taxpayer who's paid. And we should really try to get the money from the school first. Thank you. So you said that there was this um, part of the failure with Globe and Minnesota School of Business was a failure of the accreditation agency. So what is the rationale for having this accreditation agency, you know, kind of come back into the fold? I'm really not sure. I mean, I think part of it is they're trying to claim that they are a new actor and they've changed their ways. But, you know, it's only been about two years, which is not very much time. They've, they've, you know, it takes time to rewrite standards. And, you know, it's not just about sort of saying you're going to be a good actor on paper, but walking the walk and talking the talk. And I am not clear that that's really been enough time to show that their act has really changed and they've gotten better. Thank you. Um, let me just um, go back to this question that um, Senator Hassan was probing on, which is the uh, relative importance of looking at program accountability versus institutional accountability. And I'd be very interested to hear um, what, what others on the panel um, think about this and, and how, we, you know, how we balance these. So really, anybody? Chime in. Sure. So especially when thinking about transparency for students, they need information at the program level to make decisions. Uh, students are sometimes choosing between multiple institutions, but sometimes they're only choosing between programs within an institution. And so they need that information, especially on things like workforce outcomes that are closely tied to, uh, to the program that a student is enrolled in. At the same time, institutions often are the locus of control for making uh, 
policy decisions that impact all programs across the institution. And so there's a role to play, like Dr. Carnevale said, for both program and institutional level uh, data, transparency and accountability here. Leadership really matters, and that leadership often is at the institution level. Great. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that in just a few seconds? Uh, I think there's two other issues at the program level. One is, you know, we need to keep the overall institutional finances in mind. And the second thing is, we know outcomes vary by graduates of programs. We don't know if they vary by dropouts. And so one of the things you see is, for example, about a quarter of community college students who do not repay their, have not reduced their loan balance, never declared a program. Mm -hmm. So where do they fit within a program accountability structure? Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Warren. Uh, Mr. Chair, if it's all right with you, I'll yield to Senator Kane. It's all I, right with me if it's all right with Senator Kane. I, I very much appreciate uh, that, Senator Warren, and to the chair and ranking. Thanks Senator for this. Kane. Thanks for this great hearing, and thanks to all of your testimony. My colleagues have asked most of the questions that I was interested in, but there's one in particular I think I'll focus on, and that is uh, military uh, military families and veterans. I'm on the Armed Services Committee. I'm the father of a Marine. With Senator Burr, I'm the chair of the Military Family Caucus here in the Senate. There was a letter that was sent to the ranking and chair in both houses in February from a group of military, military family, veterans organizations. And I'll just, I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs of the letter, and then I'll ask that it go into the record. Dear combined chairman and rankings, on behalf of national organizations representing our nation's military service members, veterans, survivors, and military families, we write to urge you to ensure that important laws and regulations protecting students are not watered down or eliminated. We hope that bipartisan agreement is possible in order to protect America's military heroes and their families. Next paragraph, as you may know, veterans, service members, survivors, and military families are too often singled out and targeted with the most deceptive fraudulent college recruiting. A loophole in the Higher Education Act's 9010 rule has the unfortunate effect of incentivizing proprietary colleges to view veterans, service members, survivors, and military families as, quote, nothing more than dollar signs in uniform and to use aggressive marketing to draw them, close quote, as Holly Petraeus, the former head of the Service Members Affairs at the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, explained. This is because the loophole caps the federal funds proprietary schools can receive, but fails to list funds from the Departments of Defense and VA, and many proprietary colleges target DOD and VA funds to offset the cap on federal funds. As a result, our nation's heroes are targeted with the most deceptive and aggressive recruiting. Thus, it is critical to fully uphold the existing protections that help stop these abuses. I'd like to introduce that for the record, if I might, Mr. Chair. Thank you. It will be. Um, my question to each of you, and, and Ms. Voigt, you talked about veterans as sort of being a group that we're now paying some attention to as a subgroup in an important way. I see this on all of my colleges. As, as we're grappling with the Higher Ed Act, talk a little bit about things like the 90-10 rule and potential reforms to it. Or, or gainful employment, you were responding to Senator Smith generally about that topic. What we ought to be sensitive to so that we can protect the military, military families and veterans from being targeted with deceptive practices. And I direct that to any, Mr. Miller, you look like you want to jump in. Sure. Um, so first of all, Senator Kane, as you mentioned in, in that letter, we absolutely have to close the loophole in the 90-10 rule. You know, we don't want to create a situation where essentially veterans are multipliers for financial aid. Um, the second is I think we need to be a, doing a better job looking at the actual outcomes achieved of veterans and holding schools accountable for not serving them well. So right now we don't have as much reporting on that as we should. Um, the third thing is we talk a lot about sort of accountability to help protect them and we don't talk enough about what do we do to help, help a veteran student if they are stuck in a school that is not using their time well, that is not giving them a good education. And I think part of that is, you know, we don't want them to lose their housing benefits if a school closes right away. Right. And we also want to make sure that we have plans in place to help them with credit transfer and to really guide them so they don't suddenly find themselves stuck having invested large periods of time with no help. And this is, uh, you, you respond talking about veterans, um, and this is a more broadly veterans, uh, military family, active Absolutely. duty who receive a tuition assistance benefit because of their yes. active duty status. This affects an awful lot of people, and I see all of them on my campuses in Virginia. Are there others who would like to address the topic? Yeah, yeah Dr. Carnival. Uh, myself, my two brothers, my father, and my uncle all went to college on veterans' benefits. Um, I never knew the check just came, uh, which I think is the problem now, uh, because there's an issue about how the veterans are using that money. 
and we've had a problem. I remember this all began with the for-profit school dust up over on the house side where I was involved some. And what stuns me is that we still don't know how veterans use their benefits. We don't know what majors they're in, what programs they go to, what the benefit is relative to the, that is we don't collect basic gainful employment data on veterans. I, part of that is because I've been in conversation with the VA and DOD and others about this, is they're worried uh, that it won't be flattering. I think they're wrong. I think it will be flattering, um, at least from what I know about veterans and their tendency to pick uh, fields of study that have an earnings return. I think the VA will come off very, very well. But that simple step of stop just sending the checks, ask somebody to find out what they're doing with those checks, whether they're in programs that help, whether they're getting decent counseling, I don't think they are. Uh, that to me is the answer here. The for-profit school thing is, is to some extent on this issue a bit of a red herring. We don't know how they do in the other schools either. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'm going to yield back to my colleague and I'm going to ask a similar question, QFR, for those who couldn't respond. I'd love your ideas to help us as we work on HEA. Thanks, Senator Warren. Thank you, Senator Kane. Senator Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, there seems to be a difference of opinion about whether we should have an accountability system that treats for-profit colleges differently from other colleges and universities. So I just want to jump straight into that discussion. Mr. Miller, which colleges are driven by the personal financial interests of private investors rather than accountability to state taxpayers or volunteer boards of trustees? Uh, for-profit colleges, Senator Warren. For-profit colleges. And which colleges have to demonstrate quarterly profit growth to please Wall Street shareholders? Those are the publicly traded for-profit colleges. And which colleges usually spend far more money on marketing and advertising than they spend on actually teaching anything? Those are also in the for-profit sector. And which colleges enroll less than 10% of all students but are responsible for nearly 30% of all student loan defaults. That's the for-profit college sector. And which colleges are more often investigated or sued by state and federal authorities for defrauding students? Those are also for-profit colleges. And which colleges are the only schools that force their students to sign away their legal rights through arbitration agreements? Those are also what we've only seen in the for-profit sector. And which colleges are responsible for 98.6% of all fraud claims from defrauded students? For-profit colleges as well. So two of the largest college collapses in the history of American higher education occurred recently when Corinthian and ITT imploded, ruining the lives of hundreds of thousands of students. What kinds of schools were those? They were for-profit colleges, Senator Warren. Mr. Miller, are for-profit colleges different? And should the federal government have rules that acknowledge that difference? I believe they are, Senator Warren. I mean, I, I believe we've seen that we have a financial aid system now that allows for profit without showing high-quality student outcomes as well, and that the business model in the wrong hands becomes too much about recruitment and not quality. Well, thank you. You know, investors in for-profit colleges often focus on boosting their profits by squeezing every possible dime out of students and out of taxpayers by any means necessary, even if it sometimes means breaking the law. For-profit colleges are different. And when the federal government pours billions of dollars into these colleges, we should put some restrictions on the money that recognize those differences. History shows us that for-profit colleges need heightened accountability, but I think there is a much larger problem here, and that is all colleges pretty much get access to federal dollars no matter the quality of the education that they provide, and no matter how high tuition rises, and no matter how hard it is for students to repay their loans. We have built a system where everyone but the wealthiest students need a federal grant or a federal loan in order to afford college. And then the federal government and the accreditors put their rubber stamp of approval on these schools and students reasonably conclude that those schools will pay off for them because we have vouched for them. Mr. Delisle, I know you're concerned about accountability for the taxpayer. 
But isn't the best way to protect the interests of the taxpayer to stop rubber stamping bad schools and funneling federal dollars into them in the first place so that students can get cheated by them? Well, I mean, I, I, I think you're right in terms of, you know, some of the, the gatekeeping role that accreditors have played and state authorization, I mean, clearly hasn't prevented a, a, a lot of problems and a lot of bad outcomes. Okay. Um, and so I think that, but I, but I also think that if, if you have a sort of student outcome in mind that you think is, is acceptable and a student outcome in mind that you think is bad and unacceptable, I think that standard can apply to institutions regardless of how much money they're getting and regardless of their tax status or whether or not they have private investors. Oh, well, you know, I'd be fine with that if the schools were the same. But I think as the list of questions I went through with Mr. Miller show, we know where the principal problem is. Uh, and we need to focus on that principal problem. It's hurting a lot of students. You know, I think that this is, it, part of what we're talking about here is about incentives. And I think that most schools are acting rationally within the terrible system of incentives that we've set up. Now, I believe that we should have some risk sharing and some accreditation reform legislation to realign our incentives. We have made terrible choices in this country to rely on student debt as the way that most students have access to higher education. And it has really thrown our thinking about accountability out of whack. Instead of asking whether or not students are leaving college ready to focus on successful lives that aren't dominated by monthly debt, we focused almost exclusively in terms of accountability on whether students literally can pay the bare minimum to repay their debts to the federal government. I don't see how we can reauthorize this law without fixing both the college accountability problem and the structural student loan debt problem that's behind this entire business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Senator Murray, <laughs> do you have any? I don't have any additional questions. I will submit some for the record, but I just want to thank all of you for being here. I think this has been a very productive question. Uh, accountability is obviously important, but it seems to me a one-size-fits-all for 7,000 different colleges is, uh, is not one that's going to work. We, and we, as Senator Warren just talked about, the bad actors, we need to think about that and how we make sure that, that we uh, look at how we do accountability in the right way. Um, but this has been a very productive hearing, and again, I want to thank all of our witnesses. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. Well, thank you, Senator Murray. This has been a, a good hearing. It's another, we try to have bipartisan hearings in the sense that we agree on the witnesses, so we get different points of view, and we, and we have. I would encourage each of you, if you have additional thoughts, um, remember, we're, we're going to be writing a bill in the next few weeks, and if you have specific I mean, I would invite you to put yourself in our shoes and say, if I were Senator Alexander or Senator Murray, I'd write it this way. If you want to send us two, three, four pages, uh, that could be very helpful to us and to our staff as we work together to do that. Uh, listening to Senator Warren's uh, comments, I just can't help but ask Dr. Carnevale. I know Dr. DeJoy at Georgetown University is a very successful president. Uh, Dr. Connor Valley, what if he announced to his board he intended to operate Georgetown University at a loss for the next 10 years? What do you suppose would happen? Uh, I suppose he would, uh, he would, uh, he's one of the longest tenured presidents and that would end. Yeah. So I gather you think that relying on the outcome of different universities, different kinds of campuses is more important than looking at whether they're for profit or public or I think or the I think the for-profit schools have performed uh, I gotta tell you I've been the expert witness they shut down 45 of them but I think the for-profit schools have uh, performed an admirable function in the United States because they're like the German and the Japanese uh, in the 1970s and 80s when we started to uh, fail in manufacturing that is they've raised all these issues uh, they're the people that put gainful, their behavior resulted in gainful employment on the table. I agree with them that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Uh, we, if we set standards and they don't make them, then they shouldn't get Title IV money. But that should also be true for the rest of the higher education system.
Thank you. Um, and I think Senator Murray's question earlier was, was the one we're really trying to focus on today. In addition to cohort default rate, uh, what should we be looking at? And uh, you've, you've given us some, some good, good, good answers about that. Um, and in terms of data, which is another way to accountability, how do we, how do we ask, make sure we're getting the right data without just imposing multitudes of new requirements for data for researchers that students never see or never use? I think that's part of our challenge. 